Welcome, uh, viewer, to the, uh, the channel. Uh, in this one, we're going to be discussing whether or not the internet's a mistake or whether or not it's a cult. I'm really good by the panel here today. I couldn't imagine better people on the planet to discuss this topic. Uh, we've got Tyler right here. Uh, we've, uh, and let's go to my introduction. Tyler is another technology just that Beverly Illumini has been on Beverly a lot in his first few years and moved on to co hosting the Weinstein Portal Discord Delivering Community. Tyler has also been working on his Metagora work project, a way to help individuals identify where they can fit work into the world productively to solve things like Enomi. And then we're after uh, the one in the other corner. Yeah, thanks for waving. So Nick is a routine guest and co-host of the Paul Vanek YouTube channel. Paul being one of the Christian priests who made it big on YouTube in his engagement with the little people discussion format. Uh, and, and Nick has appeared on several Beverly streams, even as an interview of him too, focusing on the topics of cults. We'll have any relevant link in the video description when it goes up on YouTube. And in the middle, we've got Michael. Michael's a senior technologist and former thesis dropout who set up his own university, the Invisible College, to complete, complete it. He now works on extension to the HTTP protocol to bring state synchronization to the web. Michael also runs Cheeseburger Therapy, a CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy online service with real trained humans. Michael has been interviewed on Beverly a few weeks ago. Uh, so three technologists here and Nick, which has a lot of expertise in the overall is Internet Occult uh, thing. And it's something we've all been concerned about and focus our careers on a lot. For myself, uh, I founder of Beverly, big open source developer and moved to philosophy because sort of life experience is really went in a counterintuitive way uh, and that led me to philosophy. So it actually, uh, one of the reasons why we're holding a discussion, we'll go into, there's a, a fairly large agenda, but we want to get into some really good topics towards the end uh, where we can probably hopefully further the frontier of this. And I think we probably will continue figuring the gas on the show. So we'll power through uh, the introduction. So the, you as the viewer and the panelists are on the same page. And with that, uh, one of the things that started to bring this into my own mind was I quit Facebook in 2014, deleted it, and recently relocated, wanted a new social group, kind of rejoined Facebook, and then was surprised to realize how political it was. And also, over the years, I've seen kind of people get more and more attached to social media, not really putting their phones down at social events. Uh, and it kind of made me aware that it's kind of like a cult, like people feel they need to be part of this. Uh, and when you leave it, you realize it's not really an important part of your life. Uh, and it was very much inspired by the works by Cal Newport, uh, as well as um, the book uh, Indistractable. So Cal Newport did Digital Minimalism and the book Deep Work. He's now done a new one, How to Quit Email. Uh, so he kind of covered an issue where the distractions of the internet, both authors have covered it, uh, removing us from the things that are actually important in our own lives. So is the internet a political tool, a mimetic parasite? Uh, and we'll go into this. So there's this idea of mimetic warfare, where instead of just genetic warfare, where you have tribes killed the physical bodies of tribes, there's the idea of mimetic warfare, where memes or ideas are killing other ideas, and that allows rebirth from an individual, a very Peterson-esque, also Viveki-esque uh, notion. Dawkins was the one who kind of introduced it as like a little side note to his uh, end chapter of uh, The Selfish Gene, where the idea is that uh, the memes are actually the ones that are actually competing and evolving, and at least a lot quicker than the bodies. And the advantage of that is, uh, the memes can tr transcend the bodies. You can rebirth mimetically multiple times. That's the the mythological story of the phoenix, or many rebirth stories in many religions. So the other issue, though, is you have a mimetic colonization where memes want to colonize uh, people's minds. Uh, and this could be a company wanting to hire other people with a creates an evangelism department, much like a religion creates an evangelism department, and wants to convince everyone to work at the company or wants to convince everybody to uh, join the religion um, or the church. So you have this idea of colonizing people's minds to share the meme you believe in. This is also the role of journalism, where it's like we, the journalists, consider themselves fighting for the memes of truth, uh, but the attention economy, which Michael did a paper on, 
uh, his thesis paper goes into great detail about say some of the issues with that where you know campaigning for people's attention is it still aligning with their interests of truth uh so tyler's got some notes on this we'll go more into that later i just want to power through uh these foundations so the other idea here is memes just like genes can evolve they are put into competitive issues so competition survival drift uh nix calls this mimetic entropy uh and this, tyler's also introduced the topic we can probably go into later called meme speciation by hard forking and we also have the idea of mimetic parasitism or maladaptivity if we get possessed by bad ideas uh, then we could deploy cognitive behavioral therapy to get us out of it. Like a generalized anxiety panic disorder, we're considering things to be fight or flight, even though they're not actually threatening. We're oversensitized to stress environment. I mean, stresses, uh, in which case it's actually a bad idea and we need to eject or exercise ourselves from that jet, uh, idea. And there's also the idea of mimetic possession, very similar to parasitism, but Possession can be also possessed by a god, be it like Aphrodite, or possessed by love, like a force that is embodied by a god. So sometimes being embodied by Aphrodite is great. You have love with your wife, it's a great union. But other times, embodied by Aphrodite is bad. You have an affair, everything goes to shit, you go into the abyss. Yeah. Uh, so possession by memes can be good or they can be bad. Uh, religions have historically been good until they fall apart and, and fail as people as they don't withstand the challenges of new memes. Uh, so one of the issues of truth here is uh, infiltration and over-specialization, as well as maturation, anomie, uh, hyper-normalization is another one we'll probably go into later. These are very certain areas of research. Uh, we'll, we'll probably dive into that later rather than me actually going into it. Jonathan Haidt writes about it. Uh, Adam Curtis goes into uh, hypernormalization a lot. There's a documentary called that. So uh, the other thing that happens then is we form into mimetic tribes or religions cults. So rather than just being an individual, we're our, we're our own island. Eventually, memes start coalescing into collective will. And that's the birth of politics and also the birth of civilization. Instead of everyone doing the same job, which is survive, instead, Farmers can grow food, you can then have police, you can have governors, you can have, have traders, you can have shopkeepers, you can have a whole array of specialized jobs to then grow society. And this, uh, this is interesting because then you also have where society is also fighting other societies in mimetic warfare or even religions fighting other religions in mimetic warfare. And eventually religions or society this can fail if there's better ideas. One of the major threats to the West that Sam Harris became obsessed with is ISIS, which is, and uh, hypernot the documentary by Adam Curtis, hypernormalization goes into it as well, which is suicide bombing is a decentralized threat. Uh, how does a centralized force, a centralized protector, protect yourself from a decentralized threat? So certain new ideas can become incredibly dangerous to the stability of prior ideas. Uh, and we also have the uh, development from feudal to individual to collectivist cor to corporate. Um, one of the things people don't really know that much is uh, fascist Italy was also a corporatocracy uh, where the country was divided into different companies. I think it was like 22 different, different companies. Uh, so the libertarian idea of let's just make everything companies or privatize everything uh, can also go down some very bad routes. So these are also kind of these is where as, as things coalesce into the power of collective will or politics, we have some really interesting uh, phenomena play out. Phenom uh, so one of the, we'll, uh, phenom I'll touch on those interesting phenomena in one moment. Uh, so uh, we one of the other innovations here was a, rather than just uh, everyone amassing into one religion and then that religion represents the people and then they're fighting eventually there was the separation of religion from state joan of arc is like a good example of why that was a good idea uh because there's the meme at the end of uh one of the movies about where it's like you've killed a saint uh and you know considering you can kill a saint it's kind of a bad idea of why uh legalized murder on behalf of the state or legalized killing on behalf of the state for ideological reasons 
may be insufficient to maintain in a society. So what happens is you then have a separation of state from the memes, and that allows the state or the nation to revise quicker because it's able to facilitate that mimetic entropy, uh, as Nick has called it earlier. So, so you then have a battle then where companies, governments, uh, any large player is now trying to control the memes of a nation or cross nation internationally. And this opens into the propaganda war. Uh, the major players of propaganda traditionally were governments. Now it's companies uh, and or governments as well <laughs> invading companies uh, through the medical war. I felt like the Russian election uh, influence was one of those things where they invaded social media accounts, spread uh, disinformation to cause destabilization. And was, that's just been the cold warfare, uh, spread destabilization. Uh, Netflix, Apple TV, Amazon Prime uh, all, all have different angles to what they consider to be virtuous. And we kind of see that Facebook and Twitter, they have different filter bubbles of what they consider to be virtuous. And Discord also is interesting. They're kind of monitoring everything uh, because we, one of the other focus areas of this panel is this good is uh, all of us have some interest, I guess, with decentralized organization, but also decentralized technology and kind of played a role also in furthering that. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, in modern climate, the major players here are China versus Russia versus USA nationally, um, but also churches fighting it out with each other. Uh, and one of the issues for the hypernormalization part is if reality is so complex and overly complex, then maybe we'll fall into uh, overly simplistic beliefs to try and wrestle with the chaos of reality. And that could be like, instead of science, a method of inquiry of revision and empowerment of the individual, instead it becomes scientism, where it's just, just a belief in authority or a belief in experts. So how can we defend against scientism? That's one of the things we'll explore. And then we get into neurolinguistics. We will leave that one up to uh, probably Tyler and Michael, they'll be able to go onto that we go, uh, very well. We'll touch on that later. But one of the, of my uh, big concerns here is uh, we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs. First, you have physiological needs, yeah. needs like food, shelter. Uh, then you have uh, happiness needs, you have, like socialization. And then you have you know, self-actualization as this highest tier. And one of the issues of political or collective will, or, uh, so political power, the tool of politics, is that it can inverse that pyramid where instead of it being your individual responsibility to meet your physiological needs and your social needs and then your actualization needs. Instead, you can actually say, hey, there's this tool of politics. Uh, let's have politics. Let's have other people meet my needs instead. And that may become more and more a tool that is a viable option as the power to leverage collective will uh, plays out. And that's been like the political debate for like maybe the last 40 years or so in the West. And it's some you think, or even in the last 120 years, uh, the Nazis and fascists and, and Japanese and a lot of the world was trying to create this, this global classless, or not even global, either national classless society or a global classless society like these utopias, where the collective will can be such a strong tool to meet everybody's needs. Uh, and it worked out terribly. <laughs> so, uh, but we also have areas where it's kind of like a Frankenstein monster, like modern Western countries, where there's like a welfare state and there's also some degree of freedom. Uh, and on the other end, you also have China, where that there's also uses of collective will as an attempt to uh, empower people. So a little bit different than a complete utopian version. So we have to be really careful then. Uh, to not just sacrifice our responsibility as individuals, uh, to have someone else meet our, our needs to uh, and utilize politics for that because it robs us of our agency. Uh, Tyler's own Metagora project focuses a lot on this and we can probably go into a lot. I just did a stream about this with uh, on Homer's works, Iliad and Odyssey. So one of the uh, issues there is, uh, in the same way we have politics as the tool of harnessing collective will, we now also have the internet recently. And as technologists, uh, we've also seen Facebook, Twitter, all these other tools, Google, 
you know, promise one thing and also turn into a mass surveillance network where they're modeling simplistic models of us to modify our behavior. There's the movie Social Dilemma, which I covered with Pierre Trek uh, on the Beverly Channel a few episodes back. We go into a lot of the concerns and how serious it is, which is now you have bidders buying for the modification of behavior. So you can modify thousands of people's behavior uh, by having enough money to, to pay for the models to have run and then find out how to change it. Cambridge Analytica has done it for presidential and prime minister races. So how can we actually find out everything this demographic believes? How can we pander to it? How can we influence them? How can we do little behavioral modifications or perceptual changes or perceptual management along the way? In which case then it poses like maybe just like how the Mezzanites or the Amish kind of have a issue with technology. They kind of think, well, technology doesn't really help us with the human experience of happiness and fulfillment. Maybe we should ask maybe the same question with the internet as well. As well, Is the internet a mistake? Should we mistake books, not apps? Like, is it a bias of technology? People who like technology, like maybe we always want to create an app, but maybe a book is better to create behavioral change. Should we promote untethered time over connected time? Now I don't run with any smartphone or any watch. I just run without any technology. And it's been one of the best decisions I've made uh, this year. Uh, and how, how can we create technology that respects and promotes untethered time uh, rather than always wanting us to click back, click back, more attention, more attention. Um, the book, uh, a lot of project management books, they go into how YouTube deliberately has selected uh, engagement over time, uh, over high density value in a short amount of time because long time, short time gives more engagement, gives more addiction, gives more ad revenue. So it's where the market forces or competitive forces of the state of the internet are actually hurting the productivity of the nation and the benefit of Google. So, and is this our responsibility or should we just, you know, vote in politicians to kind of solve this? And what place does disciplines, ethos, telos come in? Uh, so a discipline through ethos or philosophy to be through telos, politics, you know, should we just uh, accept our lot or can we change things through pol political nature? Should we just become anarchists? What's the solution? So that's, you know, the questions that, that we can try and tackle uh, in this conversation. And hopefully it'll be really worthwhile for, for everyone here. <laughs> so, all right. So you know, I've got the audio uh, working. So I've spent some, like one minute and rehash. Oh, actually, what, everyone rehash the points in one minute, and then we'll pick it up where we were. <laughs> <laughs> Nick was about bad relationships and uh, the cultic influence of relationships. Are relationships evil? We are. Uh, we don't throw out relationships, although some movements do. Like Adolf Huxley tries tried communism somewhat tries to do it as well, where it's like the next stage of evolution is removing the evils of relationships, have the state of the children instead. Uh, technology has also kind of done it where we stick iPhones in front of kids, put them straight into the virtual world uh, because reality is too difficult. Uh, Michael, uh, you talked about the religious audio, they're coming together. Yeah, are relationships evil? Yeah. Um, and you know, it kind of seems like uh, and also deplatforming. Like we can't let those extremists get together and have conversations because they're going to organize and, and cause some problem. And and oftentimes, I think we see in therapy that when you are faced with some negative feeling and some negative experience, going through that and seeing it is what's going to lead you to the positive. And so, as groups, we might be all caught in this collective fear of relationships when really that's what we need. But there's something we're afraid of in that in that confrontation with each other because we see it through each other's eyes. And if we're not together, we might just be ignoring it. Yeah, yeah. I really want a map of the internet in terms of its representation, representational elements in the human psyche. Right. I want a shadow tab. Right. I want a creativity tab. I want a like memory tab. I, I want I want a sense of how it is. Yeah, like for instance. Um, like there's there's family there's ancestry.com or whatever um there's uh there there's endless amounts of entertainment there there are different like cohorts of of groups that kind of express different preferences and capacities 
And I, I'd like to be able to see that whole giant amorphous thing in a metaphorical glance. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, and then like just maybe maybe just taking in the state of the whole system, like an omni-considerate position where you see really like what the actual state of the thing is that you're contributing to or not contributing to. Um, right. Cause there's a crazy underbelly. Uh, by the way, that image would be like this tiny little dot right here. And then a huge porn bubble. That's what it would look like. And we would just, we would all just close that tab immediately because it's, that beast is too, uh, too difficult to confront. So yeah, I don't know. There is something to that, right. Running away from our fears for sure. Throwing the question back. How do you get there? How do you face the fear? How is it that you, so, I mean, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the cheeseburger therapy side, Michael, but um, I'm, I'm a little familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy as a modality. Um, yeah, like how is it, how is it that we can pull into uh -huh. our, this cultural discussion uh, as simple a, a set of ways as possible for, for the average Joe to, to, you know, wind their way through it without getting too injured in the process? Yeah, well, the, the the central like what I've seen the the most the general mechanism of every therapy, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or like a theater therapy, you know, um, is taking some traumatic some traumatic experience you had and putting it into some safe space to relive it and go through it again and re-experience it from some distance and getting a new perspective. And doing that with another person works way better and is way more healing. And so I think as a group, what that means is being able to safely hear each other's stories and hear what is the problem. At the root of all these, there's some problem, there's some you know, original sin or some negativity or something that's driving each person. And we have to hear that with each other without the safety of that relationship breaking up or, or failing or turning into attack. Because the problem that we have exposing ourselves to others is that we're opening up vulnerabilities. I'm telling you about things about myself where I'm being so honest with it that you might, you're going to be able to think about it more than I can <laughs> because I'm just going to, I have to put all my attention into being that, which means that you can think a few steps ahead and you might be able to attack me with this. And so we have to, we learn to protect ourselves when we're in these wars. And right now we're in this really chaotic internet environment. It's like a Leviathan. It's a state of nature. There's total anarchy. And you don't know who to trust. You don't know where you can find trust. And so we have to be building that up. And you build that up in the sort of tit for tat way by, by listening to people and proving, hey, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm not, I'm, I'm putting so much attention towards listening to you. I'm going to be able to say this back to you and say it back in a positive way because I've been thinking about loving you this entire time you've been talking. And that's a way that you can prove that things are safe and you can talk. And the more you talk, the more you share your stories and the more both of you can progress. Uh, it, yeah, we covered this. Uh, well, I covered it in uh, the quality of Xenia or the virtue of Xenia in the Odyssey and Iliad live stream. And part of it that wasn't uh, recorded, unfortunately, to rehash that you raised was that uh, uh, the clean room type of situation where we have a, as an individual, we a sense of control over our lives you want to feel as if agency actually exists it provides better outcomes uh i was the internet is this overly complex thing it's like a room that we have to engage with and do we project an order system on top of it to create order or do we become strong within ourselves to be able to deal with chaos and have it not overwhelm us like be okay with chaos existing in the world know that there are snakes in the garden um and that kind of poses an interesting thing. And to go to, to one of your points, Tyler, th this desire to kind of have this, you know, great mimetic structure that, that's available to the people, uh, to some extent, is already available to NSA, Google, Facebook, to some extent, like it's always going to be an oversimplified model, but they have, have that data, they're running that data, the finance people are running it as well to find out whether or not to give you loans, or even how a market will react to political instability or sort of news cycles. Uh, so these algorithms are managing billions of people and trillions of dollars. Uh, so there's a issue here where the D-Web or decentralization movement is like saying, hey, why don't we put that power in everybody's hands? Why is it just exclusive to the secret keepers? Why And also the potential liars, like officially sanctioned lies uh, isn't categorized as fake news, which is bizarre, <laughs> right? Like when the 
government is deliberately telling you a lie. Like, that's not fake news, but it is fake news. <laughs> so um, the movie Hypernormalization goes into that by Adam Curtis. Uh, and yeah, it, or the movie the Official Secrets or any of the Snowden revelations or any whistleblower revelation is like trying to unblock, you know, uncover a, a, a sanctioned lie. Uh, so there's a danger here, which is like, a, like, to some extent, I think it's great that, uh, like, I hope as well that we could have all this ability, like Cody Wilson is kind of doing that with guns, where it's like, I'm sick and tired of the gun debate. Let's give everybody guns through 3D, 3D printed guns. It blows that debate out and moves us into the next mimetic evolution cycle or the next, uh, like, you know, the dinosaur age, like where the dinosaurs went through age as the environment change. It causes humans to go into the next uh, competitive age when everyone has guns. Uh, and it's interesting as it's a way to deal with decentralized threats and actually have a decentralized force that can deal with decentralized threats. But you also have a situation where you also need a strong culture where people don't want to kill each other. Uh, and that goes into what Michael mentioned about this coming together um, and what Nick introduced as well on relationships. Uh, Tyler or Nick, who, who wants to go? Take it, Nick. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have two things. Uh, one of the topics I brought up when we were muted um, was kind of reframing the question, you know, assuming that cultic structures are naturally going to form when we're, sorry, when we're interfacing with something like the internet. Um, <clears throat> Reframing the question to what does a healthy cultic structure look like compared to an unhealthy cultic structure? I have animals everywhere. This is too much. Um, and it's interesting that when faced with this extreme chaos, what seems to have automatically arisen is extreme purity culture, right? And I think this ties into what Michael was saying in this type of like autoimmune response, almost this like hyper defensive, you know, well, if I'm perfect, then I'm unattackable in this situation. And I can make, I can navigate all of these relational kind of territories without fear, right? I don't actually have to be trusting or have to have meaningful relationships because I can always fall back on my purity, right? Um, and this, I would think, would fall quite deeply into an unhealthy strategy for <laughs> navigating a system like the internet. Um, the other point I had was in something you had said, Ben, and I can't remember it, so I'll pass the, pass the torch there. <laughs> we'll go Todd and then we'll go Michael. Yeah, so I, I think, um, so to, we're talking generally, just let me bring it back to the topic. We're, we're talking talking generally about culture, why it exists and how it's moving forward and its contact with the internet and what's developed. I think, Nick, early on, you were bringing in Verbeke's work and talking about how culture is like this carrying capacity for understanding the environment. Um, and so it's necessarily trying to do this information processing um, mechanism and then you have to be able to carry that through in language right and so and here's the issue it's tied so deeply to language because you see as these internet communities self segregate they develop their own languages and then they use them against each other um, and in many cases like they can have the they can develop opposite senses of words right and this is often what you see and this is weinstein's point that he was always harping on about russell conjugation or emotive conjugation um, that there are specific ways in which uh, linguistic groups um, kind of invert meaning or attach different emotive uh, contexts. Um, so there is really this element, I think, of trust. If we get down to the very bottom of it, it's trust. Because when you think about culture as uh, a system of educating the individual node to its place in the network, then that process of education is one by imbibing information. And that is necessitating an aspect of trust. Because if you can't trust the information, you lose the ability to learn about the environment. So trust is like you know, right at the very start of things. And that's why, and this is another point that points on his heart. Well, he, he has he has this um, mimetic capsule for it. He calls it the twin nuclei problem. 
uh, that now we, that we can unlock the secrets of the cell and the secrets of the atom, that we have these existential crises that didn't quite exist before. But he, he always, he always <clears throat> coincidentally leaves off. But this, and this is the thing I would argue with him directly. I say, but it's actually a trinuclei problem, Eric. And that third center is the mind, right? Back in the 50s and, and since, we've really gotten a good sense of how to manipulate each other's minds. And the internet is like the Wild West with every bit of that being uh, thrown against the wall and being studied on how it, how it manipulates opinion. And now that we have that power to really get into each other's minds, um, we've, I think, essentially destroyed our ability to trust. And that is what causes that initial like collapse into your group of trust, right? And then you, you don't branch out from there. That's, that's the cycle of the pressures, I think, that produce that, that cultic-like closing of the borders um, and then inability. So this is, we could talk about the good and the bad, right? Because the permeability problem is key to the healthy qualities of a cultic group, right? How often does it make real contact with the outside world and, and how does it exchange its resources? Right? Does it is it subject to decays of various kinds? Um, yeah, how, how is it its internal structure mediated, and how does that like connect with its external structures? Um, a lot of times, um, there are very specific problems that crop up over and over again, and there are shadows of the same problems that we see playing out at the socio political layer at the level of governments, um, and and the same ones, by the way, that exist at the level of the family. And this isn't a coincidence, because from a Piagetian framing. Um, that, you know, and, and from a Jungian framing and just from a, a, looks like a common perspective framing, what culture is, is a manifestation of all of our individual perspectives and our individual psyches and all of our fears and desires, you know, writ large and then carried in, in tokens. And so, uh, of course, it's all out there. And yeah, like, like hmm, that's, that's what I think we are getting a handle on. And I think we are getting a bit of a handle on it. Um, it's just, a, this is a liminal phase. This is a birthing phase and it's full of pain typically. And it's also quite mysterious, um, uh, and by necessity, I think, uh, because, it, you know, there, there are some real interesting ways in which the, the universe is structured. Um, I, the part of what I do when I look at the world is I, I don't look at just the way it is, but also the ways it couldn't be. Those seem to tell you a lot about you know, the way the universe wants to be, let's say, right? What is it least like? Or what, what do the rules say you can and can't do for sure? And, and when you run across a paradox, what does that tell you about you know, the, the nature of the system? And yeah, I think that's a really, I think it's a really valuable framing that we should bring to the, the manner in which we discuss all these different um, cultural topics. But fundamentally, I'd like to figure out how we can get back to, uh, let's say, the, the most reasonable unit of people that can trust each other, right? That they can actually trust each other and also, because it's not just about trust, make sense of the world. Because this is the other complaint, right? Because to go the conservative mindset, which is shut yourself off to the, the actual state of the world based on more and more refined measurements that you get to take vis-a-vis -vis science, um, is to to stop learning about the world. And that's also a, you know, this is the Amish point. It it will, of course, allow them to persist in a certain steady state for a certain amount of time, but the Amish will never be able to deviate an asteroid that will destroy the earth. However, if we're faithful to our understanding of physics and rocket science, we may be able to do that one day and need to uh, for the survival of our species. So there, there's a trade-off there, right? It's like the, the, the kinds of hoops you have to pass through in order to get to a more meta-stable point that gives you more and more capacities. And you see that same thing play out, you know, uh, biomimetically too, the way that organisms develop more capacities and have these, you know, subsequent control mechanisms, both internal and in the environment that act as pressures that guide it. So uh, maybe I'm getting a little too abstract there and I'm, I'm always doing that anyway. So I'm, I should stop apologizing for that. But uh, it, yeah, just just make sure you stop me if I'm ever wandering off into sounds uh, too deeply. A lot of thoughts there. Uh, Michael was nodding a lot. I'll go Michael and then I'll go Nick and then I'll, I'll have a little talk. Yeah, so um, we, we got a so one big question we have here um, that we keep talking about is how do you know if a cult is good or bad? How do you distinguish between a good and a bad one? 
And then how do we, what do we do to make it better? And uh, I think uh, Tyler, you're, you're bringing up um, the, you're bringing up trust is really important. And you're also noticing that the same patterns of good and badness happen both at like society level and our families and politics and in the, the individual. And so, um, you know, I've been doing this therapy stuff for a while. So I'll give you my perspective on, because I, and I see, like you, huge patterns in individual progress from bad to good um, through these interrelations. Um, and I see huge patterns also in politics and everything else. And so the therapy, so I'm just going to, here's the therapy metaphor. Maybe this will help. So therapy starts, you need to establish trust. Absolutely between the, the listener and the, the thinker. We call them, you know, the listener and the talker. And, um, and that forms the basis of your relationship. But it is possible to trust somebody who is taking you down a bad path, okay? It's possible to misplace your trust. So it's very important for us to have a good immune system reaction and know who to trust. And indeed, when we call something a cult, I, I usually think of that as our group's immune system to say, this is a bad religion. Don't go lig with them, <laughs> you know, don't form bonds and ligaments with that one. They're going to be sick. They're going to lead you down a bad path, manipulate you. So it's a very important reaction that we have. And we see declining trust, which just means we don't know who to trust. So we have to start forming some groups that are trustworthy and we can do kind of, you know, I think like Jesus did this, like, I, you know, in unconditional love, love everybody and, and let's do this. Um, and so, but we still have that question, well, how do we distinguish good from bad? And what I find in the individual level, because maybe this is a simpler case, and maybe we can all relate to this as individuals, um, when we're in a bad, let's say it's a, a belief system or a thought pattern, okay, a pattern of thought, which a cult might have also, when we're in a bad one, we probably feel bad. And we can look at our feelings. And like, we know when, when things suck, okay? You have an internal sense of when you're in an state of anxiety, when you're depressed, when you're unhappy with yourself, you know, you, you get to the point where you want to die. And that's bad. Okay, that's pretty clear. When we feel good, you know, we feel clear, we feel like one with everything, we feel like we're in a flow state, we feel like we can do stuff, clear objectives, clear goals, we feel positive about ourselves, we want to appropriate and do more good stuff. So you can look at your feelings to know individually if you're in a good or bad state. What it's hard to tell is how to get from bad to good. Okay. And that requires a bigger level picture. So what we see in cognitive behavioral therapy is, here's a basic process. If I'm a helper, I'm listening to you, I'm going to map out the events that are occurring in your life, the thoughts that you're having after those events, the feelings that you're having when you think those thoughts, and then the behaviors that you're taking when you're in that emotional state with those feelings. And then inevitably, for some reason, this I don't understand it, but I just take this as like a sign from God. If you're in a really bad state, the behaviors you're taking are going to be leading to more events that are causing more of the bad thoughts and more of the feelings. There's going to be some weird cycle there. Okay. And the thought that you're having is going to be kind of a, it's like a stressful reactive thought. Like you might be have some black and white thinking. You might be projecting into the future. Uh, you might be having a should statement to yourself, something about like the this thing has to be like this, regardless of the current state of the world. There are certain patterns there where you're reacting to the event that's coming in, but you're interpreting it through a lens that's got some distortion or some bias to it, where like, you know, there's some good and you're handling some of the, the event well, but it's leading to something else. And that like side consciousness is going to spiral back and lead to more events. And that's when we get locked up in a spiral. And that's when things get really nasty. And we see that a lot in politics. You know, if you take the political party, you don't like <laughs> the other one, <laughs> you can probably look at them and be like, you guys are self-contradictory. You know, you're creating more of the thing that you're claiming to, to, to not like. Um, and so this happens large scales. And um, so I think the root of it is we are going to, the root of it is that you, you, you feel bad. You know, both political parties are usually upset. Okay. So you're, but you know, you're unhealthy in that tribe. <laughs> um, but then if you zoom out, you can see the pattern of it. And but then you have to build the trust with the people that are experiencing that in order to talk about it, see it from a new perspective and be like, yeah, you know, what you want is this thing. Here's what you care about. I'm listening to you. So I can tell what you care about deep inside. Okay. And I can 
and we can, we can look and see this pattern of this thought and then you can let go of it and go with, go into a new direction and we can go there together and the more we do that with each other the more we're going to build up and i think right now in this uh video chat we're finding more connection together and more of this is happening online and you know out after a lot of the negative crap and like viral sick crap that we experienced over the summer i think some more i feel more positive stuff happening this part of the year maybe this is just in america i don't know um but you know in the ashes maybe we can grow something new and it's going to come from groups like this and we're going to feel better yeah i love the uh, the little americanism where we means american <laughs> all righty uh nick yeah the Direction I was going to go with it, uh, coming from what Tyler was speaking about, uh, one thing that stood out to my mind was the question of permeability or boundaries. What does a healthy boundary look like? Um, and one way I've gone about trying to ask some of these questions again about like, what are these healthy cultic structures from what are the unhealthy ones? It's actually fairly easy to map the metaphor onto the body um, as one example, right? So, and there's a few, you can interpret this in many different ways, right? Skin is a partially permeable boundary. It's mostly impermeable, but obviously it does a lot of exchange with the environment. Uh, this is important because if you didn't have it, you're just leaking vital fluids. You see this in parasitic people that come into a community. They take it for everything it's worth. It's lifeblood, and then they go distribute it elsewhere, um, right? And then it sucks all the life out of the community so that it loses the ability to generate anything um obviously right the the metaphor of food and digestion is extremely important this comes back around to the sense of trust right when you are consuming something there has to be a high level of trust with what is being consumed right this goes through a process of synthesis um and it's through the synthesis that you produce energy that then can be turned into work that allows an alteration of the environment. Um, there's lots of ways to try and kind of play with this. And it, perhaps an interesting, again, to balance it out with the negative side of it is, you know, uh, much to the cycle, um, these contradictory cycles that Michael was pointing out. You know, what is it when we say someone is full of crap? You know, in many ways, and this is a very common problem in, in groups that we normally identify from the perspective of normalcy as a cult. Um, they have a tendency to consume what they produce. Right. So they are eating their own production. Now, the physical analogy there is a little graphic, but quite obvious. <laughs> right. Being full of crap. Well, what are you putting in? Right. And why do you trust that? You should not be trusting that. You're supposed to be offering that freely back to the rest of the cycle, right? <laughs> and it's that's where it gains its value, right? And then eventually when it goes through that cycle, it becomes food once again. And we continue this, what should be a more healthy way of interpreting. Um, this also gets into the decentralized aspect, which is to say you need other cycles that consume something different to offer the, the, the offload of what you have consumed, right? So in a decentralized system, say something like a forest, um, you know, you have all of these relationships between things that allow waste to happen in a healthy way where there's not this type of bizarre food insecurity or resource um, scare that would make an animal want to consume its own production. For example, um, so yeah, that's where mind was go. My mind was going with playing with like, what are some of these healthy and unhealthy dynamics of cultic structures, and what does it look like when you start kind of expanding that vision outside of like, I'm gonna make the one healthy version of a cultic structure, right? No, you aren't because you it needs other parts to it, you know, by necessity. There has to be a boundary around a certain layer. And that boundary has to appropriately interact with the next boundary outside of it. Right. So to tie what, what all three of you uh, said and to pick up off specifically from Nick's point here is, well, actually, so one of the issues then with 
uh, engaging with chaos is you do need some way of being able to systematize or order that chaos so it doesn't appear it's a dragon and appears it's manageable. And this is like every horror movie where it's like, say the demon's name, you know, find out a way to embody the demon or understand the demon, and now you can actually wrestle. While it's amorphous, it's overwhelming, and it will get you. Um, and the psychological demons, like Barbadook, terrifying movie. Uh, Tyler helped me watch it many years ago because <laughs> I was scared out of my pants. Uh, like that one is an internal demon. The demon exists within her, and that's terrifying. Um, but then over the time, she was able to come to understand and it and i think part of this to take off what nick said is i think unless our digestive system of memes uh, is functioning correctly then, then we will get digestion with, with memes uh and, and with foreign bodies we'll get sick when we ingest them even though we shouldn't get sick when we ingest them uh we may have a mimetic or you know immune disorder so you know it could be uh, some foods are making us sick that shouldn't be making us sick. Some ideas are making us sick because we're oversensitized. And then Michael's example of the role CBT can play helps with that and also the role of Xenia from home workers. Where I think part of this uh, struggle is with the political parties, it's not just as easy as saying, one, we need to practice Xenia and practice guest friendship and love for each other. But there's also that uh, individual aspect which uh, cheeseburger therapy and CBT and uh, I believe Metagora also kind of do where it's like hey uh, you're safe uh, and you, you can not necessarily need to trust this person but you have this confidence like, you need some way to also project order into the world so you feel you can deal with it um, because otherwise you're going to always be distrustful people will offer their help to you and you'll distrust trust um, and you'll be scared you'll think they're a snake um, so it's very uh, difficult to kind of overcome those boundaries with the internet. Like people could be friendly, uh, but we misinterpret what they say. Like text chat is a typical example of that compared to high bandwidth video. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges here. And to work it in as well, like, like with technology, uh, is, you know, like I think all these services, Google, Facebook and all that, that, Twitter, they've all had these kind of good ideas and, uh, well, good intentions, but I wonder for this because are, are these problems, these coming together uh, problems, this strengthening of the individual, how much of them can actually be solved with technology or, or, or a technocratic ethic, which is let's just be at a middle man, let's just get the tech out, move the tech. You know, where cheeseburger therapy, it seems like that's a good mix of merging tech with uh, humanism. Uh, but I wonder how far that can scale, or if that's an approach we should take into like everything. Like, you know, a good example is like Braid. Like Braid is a synchronization layer for the web that could empower everyone and indie devs to have synchronization abilities. But then, you know, that's, that's going to also strengthen this this uh, cultic ability of the internet and and also some of the downsides to an extent. Uh, in which case, how does that get embodied? Like, how how can we make sure there's a immune in a healthy immune system uh, as threats and, and chaos starts encountering these new innovative technologies. Uh, I'll get, I invoke Michael's work there. So I'll go Michael and then I'll go Tyler. Yeah, how do we make things healthy with this technology? And uh, we, we can get angry at the technology. We can try to stop it. And that's what the, the Luddite is a term for. And this was originally the followers of Ludd in England, who were against textile machines. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're sewing stuff or what are we, knitting? <laughs> I don't even remember, it's so long ago. Um, that's where the term Luddite comes from because that has been present with us for so long. And sometimes we wanna, we, we like the black and white things and say, blame all these problems on X or Y. We wanna blame it on the blacks or the whites or the Jews. Um, we might wanna blame it on the technology. And because it's involved in it, and so you can point at it. That's like a half thought, you know, because the technology is good as long as being bad. And really, technology is a magnifier, and it's magnifying all the same human problems that we're experiencing. And right now, when we look at the problems that we're experiencing in our stories, like our emotions and our thoughts, 
These are human problems. Like we see this tribalism. We see the cults. We're afraid of bad stuff happening. And these are human problems that we have to evolve new human structures for. And, you know, the technology is certainly going to help. Like decentralization can give us maybe a more even magnification effect so that we don't just have a few people's delusions that are in control of the media platforms. That would be nice. It would give us more ability to form these human networks ourselves. But ultimately, we have to solve the problem as humans. And either we have to do it as the few people who are in control or as the many who have control once we've created the decentralized technology for it. I mean, uh, tools are technology. Right? It's the uh, Greek techni. And we have another word, technique. Like It's not just the tools. It's not the tools alone that allow you to do things the point I was making earlier. You also need the techniques. And techniques come from experience. It's an embodied, lived element of being in the space and using the tool and finding out that if you hammer towards yourself right, with a chisel, bad news. Or if you wear baggy pants when you're using a grinder, bad news. There are elements to the way in which you develop wisdom, which is the compression of experience over time. Uh, that can only come from the people who are on the ground, right? Whose whose face is bloody from uh, taking the wrong path. And uh, I would say, even looking at the explicit ways that the culture can harm us, we often lose sight of the the opportunity costs that come. And instead of going with hypernormalization, let's let's shift it into hypernormal stimulus. Even if the thing in and of itself is not bad, to feel so good watching all the wonderful things on the internet, but then when I turn it off to have nothing left for my companion is, is equally as distorting in the ways which we start to evaluate the world. And I would say that we should be very wary of the people who advertise their tools in such a way as to as to try to permit us to feel that we'll be granted some wisdom that we didn't earn or some capacity that we won't know how to utilize with wisdom. That's where much of the evil does seem to stem from in the world is overstepping our bounds and using tools in a way that we think we're intelligent enough to do. Uh, yeah, so I, I am optimistic. I am optimistic. I think I see the kernels of experience starting to have the conversation that will develop the fabric that people will be able to read more easily uh, and, and that we'll be able to reference and look back on and make sense of. It does seem to be shaping up, but it's been one hell of a ride. And I don't, uh, I don't dare think it's even close to over yet. So... <laughs> Got the VR VR phase next. Woo. It's gonna happen faster and faster and more and more intense. <clears throat> Where uh, my mind went with this was perhaps to more uh, direct uh, ways of looking at how our systems currently operate. So an obvious one is that when you orient what is arguably some of the most valuable aspects of human existence around um, the profit motive of advertising. That seems like, why would you think that's going to work well? Of course, that's not going to work well. Um, right. So, and this, I think, kind well, of it's on both levels because, at, because, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that seemed to fancy some thoughts there. Thoughts there. Um, <laughs> Advertising is a bad cult. There's a clear example of right, manipulative. Right listening or some manipulative connection right right and what so here's an interesting kind of comparison right so we're looking at at systems that are heavily kind of built to be decentralized like facebook right where there's there are artists there are people that magnify attention onto themselves and they have you know a hundred million eyes on them in any given moment or whatever um but it's it's weird because at the individual level, it's like we need to realize what is actually valuable to us so that when something like a Facebook comes along and it says, hey, guys, it costs five bucks a month, but 
we're not going to orient everything around sapping your attention for the sake of paying for our advertising or getting money from our advertising. And we're not going to, you know, manipulate the data so that we can do that more effectively. We need to go, hey, I'm going to pay the five bucks because this is valuable to me, right? We have to stop pretending that it's not valuable as we waste days, months, you know, whatever, 70% of our waking life staring at these apps, um, right? Obviously, it's important to us. And then the, the other effect of that is in, it's interesting how it's gone about working. And it almost, to me, feels like we're so hyper conditioned to an advertising system that, right, Patreon is an interesting example because people will pay for Patreons, but what are they paying for? They're paying for just a little sliver of attention from that person that has, you know, the 10 million people looking at them, right? And we're fine paying for that. We can easily see that that's valuable to us. And so we hand them the whatever, 10, 15, 20 bucks a month so that they read our message among the millions they get, right? Something's off there, <laughs> right? And it's not the platform's fault. And it's partially the platform's fault, but it's also like it's the individual needs to go, hey, wait a second, what am I doing? Why well, am I organizing it this way? Yeah, but I mean, like this is this is probably a direct result of what we're in right now, right? Because this is, I mean, just wind the clock back, every one of us. Mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, look at me, look at me, right? right? We get attention, it's valuable, it's extremely valuable because when we get attention, we're, we're closing the loop on feedback about how to be in the world, right? Positive attention tells you do more of that. Negative attention usually tells you do less of that. And if you use those two negative and positive valences, if you do that for 20 years, eventually you'll grow up to be, you know, within the, the viable constraints of a, of a socialized human being, um, plus or minus some, you know, some sig uh, 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 element of grace. Right. So there's there is something in there that isn't being met by the attention we're seeking. Right. It's not actually satiating us. Right. We're, we're, we're circumventing all sorts of these loops in the wrong ways. This comes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is, again, I think a personal motive that we need to change. In many ways, the reason why we pay the 20 bucks to get the message read by the famous person is because we've accidentally overweighted status and we don't realize how much trust adds value to a relationship. Yeah. Right? So, and oh, yeah. cool. appropriately, we, di we don't pay for trust, right? It's paid in other currencies. Well, that's, that's perfect. That reminded me of a, a comment that I was thinking of when Michael was speaking earlier, which, which has to do with, I think it's very often the case that people want to express themselves. And this is related to, you know, paying money in order to be seen. They want to be seen. They want to be known. But I, I wonder how often they feel completely inadequate at articulating their inner felt experience to such, to such a level that they feel they will be understood. Because I know personally, I've been through some crazy things in my life and that they have profoundly impacted the way that I choose but there's no way that I can convey the weight of all those things without sitting down and writing a book or sitting across a fireside with somebody who trusts me enough and who I trust enough to begin to open up in a way that the, the flow state is present in the communication itself. Right. And then, and then when you truly experience communication like that, you see what its value is in terms of granting. It's like granting right access to the soul right with another person and then you both are kind of updating how it is you see the world in yourselves and uh, yeah it's a phenomenal experience and it's 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 rare but it's only possible uh when when trust is placed in the, in the proper context and yeah we've completely obliterated yeah. that in, in these circumstances but we we do have to get there so let's, let's do like a quick fire kind of through those questions and one of the things is like there's a theme I think present in this, which is, hey, everyone should self-actualize and we should be like the rank fountainhead uh, type situation. And I wonder uh, one is how scalable that is. But it's certainly, regardless of how scalable it is, it seems like that's still something worthwhile to aim for. It's still something good to aim for. Um, regardless 
because they're not achieving it because a life without that is a life of delegated agency and terror. Hold on, if we're doing quick fire, let me just squeeze this in there then. I think the way that you do that is you realize that not one philosophy for all, a poly philosophy for many, right? So there's one in a thousand Randians and that's their internal compass for how to exist in the world. And the wake of that action in the world accumulates other kinds of things around it, right? And they have their own attendant philosophies and then there will be others that are completely different. And that's the same thing that's expressed epigenetically and genetically as the differentiation of organs and specialization in our bodies or on the landscape or whatever, right? So that's how we do it. We stop trying to be so mono everything. Right. Well, so then we also have the role, this adds into the next quick five, which is we have the role of technology being like a nuclear weapon, right? And, you know, the data surveillance uh, networks, things like that, the modeling, uh, even GPT or the old school lies uh, type bots where, where they can fool humans and trick humans and, you know, the modern fake news concerns. We have an issue where technology kind of forces people to then revitalize their mimetic structures to deal with it uh, in a way where it's not parasitic or not a virus. But with this, then how much of a responsibility to technologists have in, in that polytheistic uh, or, you know, polyphilosophical way? Because a lot of, I think, Silicon Valley uh, liberals take the role of assumed authority, uh, where it's like, okay, there's a lot of people who have no idea what they're doing. Uh, let's tell them how to behave. Let's, let's create technology to mold their structures into what we believe the utopia is. Uh, whereas that certainly is like part of the power of politics and this ability of to amass collective will. So is this something which the technologists or the, you know, those holding power, like is the Marxist rejection of those type of power structures good? Like, should we eliminate those power structures completely? Should they just practice a little bit more awareness? Or is it fine for certain people to kind of just try to invest in self-actualization, fail miserably? but then go to more benevolent uh, leaders, in which case is this more like an Occupy Wall Street thing where we have to revise these collective structures and make sure they're operating within the interests? Like, how do we prevent this abuse of power? Um, very quickly, I would just say it depends on the developmental stage of life, right? That, that you'll have different ways of being in different stages. Yeah, well, the way that I, I don't really see, like, I, I think... You can see this abuse of power, but that's only when you're expecting the leaders of these platforms to be able to do a good job at something. And they just don't know how. And, you know, none of us know how yet. And I, the Internet, you know, we, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs a lot. And the Internet right now is kind of like maybe a, a five-year-old kid, you know. It's like it's learned how to speak. It's just kind of learning how to listen. Um, and we're, we're developing up up those those stages i um, so it's, it's kind of hard to blame these people like i look at jack dorsey up there on twitter i'm like he doesn't he doesn't know any better you know and, and he's also like saddled with all this responsibility trying to make a business out of something you got to do the advertising thing and we're, we're gonna have to grow up and it's kind of hard to do and it takes a long time right in which case this is like a return also to the power of the individual because part of asking right whether the internet is evil or nuclear weapons are evil or, or you know that questioning of a, a established mimetic authority uh, is it opens us to the possibility hey it is hey maybe i am being exploited maybe i didn't know it opens you up to knowing what you didn't know uh about yourself and that can provide a situation like you know against the advertising business of do you need this materialism right like do you really need to watch the go running uh maybe maybe not maybe people were able to run fine without it <laughs> right so uh these type of things like do you really need uh this type of technology pervading through your lives is maybe reading books better in which case that's like a, a individuals kind of campaigning collectively using that, that organic decentralized that organic collective will to then change the thought of collective will uh, uh, as a a cyclic process um any closing thoughts any outro you want to put anything in your, your summaries? Uh, Tyler, do you want to pitch any work up to and close out? 
uh, nothing worthy of trying to compress it in here. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm always doing this stuff in various ways. There are plenty of groups that I, I'd like to try to uh, further conversation in together as communities themselves. I'm actively trying to figure out how to make that more streamlined in terms of providing a platform that maybe one day will people will pay five dollars per month to support uh, that will give them more sovereignty over the culture that they create in their space and give them the attendant tools so the tools and the techniques to use them and make it as transparent as it is as is possible so that everyone can play the the the, the cultural conditioning recognition game together on the same field as, as much as they're able to because uh, people segregate in different ways preferences and capacities and and you know it's a weird admixture of both and we have to be i think a little more cognizant of that and we have to be more encouraging of certain kinds of differentiation we have to recognize um when ignorance can harm i i you know Internet's a five-year-old, but I do not hand my um, guns to my five-year-old, right? There's, there's, a, there's a level of responsibility that has to be kind of abdicated at some point if you're not uh, consciously capable of handling the power that, that you might be able to wield. Um, and that, that truly is, uh, may, maybe that's just like a big, uh, that's a history of the world in terms of innovation, right? Every out front is crazy and hectic and it's wild west on the, the frontier. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think you need you need all these different parts of culture. Yeah, you need the the frontier, you need the middle ground, and you need the conservative on the back end, um, and all together uh, function as a healthy organism. So, so. and I'll uh, include the links on where to find or your promos in the description. I'll fetch them. Uh, Michael, uh, your outro. Where can promos? Where can you work? Sure, my outro. Yeah, you know, um, I'm. I'd say, um, I think being polypolitical is a wonderful future. Polypolitical means that we can understand all stories, and that means we understand the needs, like what values and what needs are driving people. What are they afraid of? What are they striving for? And that's going to let us come together and put ourselves together. And I think that if you're in this conversation right here, you're already doing it. And so like, you know, this, I, I love how we brought this up with this fatalist question of, is the internet even bad? Because I think when we face that question, on the other side of that is seeing, is making progress towards it being good. And um, I'm, I think it sounds like we're all working on that and I'm working on that too. And uh, Cheeseburger Therapy is growing if you're interested. We are, we're, we teach people how to listen to each other. It's peer to peer. And we teach you that you can hear and connect with a random stranger on the internet using nothing other than text chat and actually change their lives in big ways. It's been radically inspiring for me. I've had my life changed through just simple text chats and we do it to other people regularly. Um, and in our braid project, we are taking the same metaphors of human connection, uh, synchronizing our minds together and looking at that. It turns out those metaphors also play out in computing. The same algorithms that we use for synchronizing threads of computation look very similar to the algorithms that we use to synchronizing threads of thought and stories of thought. And so we're going to see some fractal nature playing out. And at the same point, in, in all of this, we are growing as individuals and in the same way that we grow as individuals and seek oneness with the universe and with each other, um, our society and our humanity online, that universe of thought is also growing its own idea, its own identity, its own concept of morality um, and moving us towards the hive mind. And so everything that we're doing together, just by putting our attention to these topics, is contributing to this glorious hive mind that we're all creating. And your, uh, your little outro. Uh, I don't have much uh, of an outro. I, I just make uh, things in the garage, so. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're always so humble. Uh, I'll include a link to at least the very interviews with you, because they're, they're definitely worth Boy. watching. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody uh, so much. I, I'll I, I'll be able to make this actually a good, a good conversation on, on YouTube. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank, thanks again for the time. I'm, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I really uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Ben.
Yeah. Tyler, and next story. Next story. Like this. <laughs>